That woman who makes the spiders, the artist that makes that pretty sexual material. I asked what artist you wanted profiled next, and you chose Louise Bourgeois. So let's get into it. Art lovers, welcome back to the channel. My name is Christopher West, and this is a place where we can talk about modern and contemporary art and design. And last week, I put a poll on YouTube and on Instagram, and I asked what artist you wanted to see profiled next, and you overwhelmingly chose Louise Bourgeois. Now, if you voted for Ed Ruscha or Ellsworth Kelly, don't worry, I'm sure I'll get to those in the near future, so just have a little patience. But today, I want to talk about Louise. Bourgeois was born in Paris in 1911, and she was one smart girl. While her parents were running their tapestry shop, she was studying mathematics and geometry at the Sorbonne. I mean, she was a STEM student at the Sorbonne before being a STEM student was a thing. She said that early on, she got peace of mind only through the study of rules nobody could change. But when her mother died in 1932, her life would take a turn. Apparently provoked by her asshole father's mockery of her grief, she attempted suicide. And now, profoundly depressed, she abandoned mathematics and started studying art. In order to stand unbearable family tensions, I had to express my anxiety with forms I could change, destroy, and rebuild. So she started painting, but she had an early encounter with Fernand Liget, who saw her work and told her she was a sculptor, not a painter. And she was also visiting different artist studios at this time, learning firsthand the techniques by these artists she admired. Artists like the graphic designer Paul Collin, famous for many of his Art Deco posters, and the Cubist painter and academic Andre Lote. Both served as mentors to a young Louise Bourgeois, but it was also at this time when the frustration began to set in. She noticed that these men, these patriarchal geniuses that dominated the art world at the time, did not pay attention to women. And she recognized that her work, because she was a woman, would never be seen the same way as if she were a man. So in 1938, she took a leap and decided to do something about it, and opened her own gallery next to her father's tapestry shop. Yes, she exhibited male artists like Henri Matisse and the romantic painter Eugene Delacroix, but she also exhibited artists like Suzanne Valadon, the first woman ever admitted into the Société Nationale des Beaux-Arts. It was in her gallery where she met the American tourist and art professor Robert Goldwater, and she decided it was time to make her escape, escape from the male-dominated world of the Paris art scene and escape from her asshole father. So Goldwater and Bourgeois got married and moved to New York City. But the transition wasn't that easy. It took many years and a lot of frustration for her to finally find her footing in her new country. In the mid-1940s, Peggy Guggenheim had a famous gallery called Art of This Century, and Bourgeois was included in an exhibition there in 1945 titled The Women. But it wasn't until the 1950s when Bourgeois joined the American Abstract Artist Group with artists like Barnett Newman and Ad Reinhardt that her work really began to gain traction. She would befriend other artists like Willem de Kooning and Mark Rothko, and her work began to transform from wood structures to materials like marble and bronze. It was with these new materials, exploring different ways of making, that she was able to confront her abusive childhood and the complexities of male-female relationships. She was able to investigate concerns like fear, vulnerability, and loss of control, and she wasn't always very subtle. Take the work Fiette, now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Pretty obviously a phallus, right? Well, some scholars say they also see a female torso, and that creates ambiguity. Ambiguous? This? I mean, it's hanging on a meat hook, for God's sake. Bourgeois said, from a sexual point of view, I consider the masculine attributes to be very delicate. I'll give her that. And when the Museum of Modern Art asked her to get her picture taken by Robert Maplethorpe for the cover of their upcoming exhibition catalog, she posed with Fiette in what I think is one of the most remarkable photographs ever taken. Of course, the prudes at MoMA thought this might be a little too much for their audience to handle. So they promptly cut Maplethorpe's photo in half and just stuck her head on the catalog. 
And then there's The Destruction of the Father from 1974. This has been called a revenge fantasy aimed at her father, who Bourgeois said was known to gloat and brag at the dinner table about his sexual conquest. Here she created a space that resembles either a dining room or possibly a bedroom. It was the first time she used soft materials on a large scale. She cast hunks of mutton and beef and plaster and covered them with latex rubber. There are breast-like bumps, phallic protuberances, and other sexually suggestive shapes. She has suggested that this piece was inspired by a childhood fantasy where they would dismember her father and shift the balance of power from him to her and her siblings. And think what you will visually about this piece, but this kind of sums up why I love art and artists. The artist's ability to take personal trauma, to take the pain, to make it into something concrete, and then to share it with the world. And many have classified Bourgeois' work as feminist, but she rejected that idea. It is true, however, that her work has always been exploring the feminine. We see this even back in the 1940s with her Femme Maison series. Femme Maison translates from the French to housewife, or literally, woman house. The heads and bodies of the nude female have been replaced by architectural forms. Bourgeois said of this series that the subject does not know if she is half naked, and she does not know that she is trying to hide. And despite the fact that Bourgeois did not think of her work as feminist, it was with the rise of feminism that her work gained a larger audience. In the 1970s, she hosted gatherings at her home where she would critique the work of young artists in New York. It was her ruthlessness in these critiques that these weekend gatherings came to be known as Sunday Bloody Sundays. And as her reputation grew, so did her artistic career. In 1978, she would create her first public sculpture when the General Services Administration commissioned Facets to the Sun. And a few years later, in 1982, she would have her first retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, the one where Maplethorpe took that famous photograph. But it wasn't until the late 1990s when Bourgeois started to create what I think of as her most iconic works. The Mamans, which simply translates from French to mom. These giant spiders that loom over the viewers can be overwhelming and even instill fear. But Bourgeois saw them as portraits of my mother. I want to walk around and be underneath her and feel her protection. The first was installed in Tate Modern's massive turbine hall. Critic Jonathan Jones wrote, Bourgeois showed that powerful images, dredged from the unconscious, can make the most massive space intimate and confessional. And if you've ever seen one of these in person, it's not something you're going to forget. The subject of pain is the business I am in, to give meaning and shape to frustration and suffering. In an essay for The London List, Ben Weaver might have summed it up perfectly. He said, it was her gift for universalizing her interior life as a complex spectrum of sensations that made her art so affecting. And Bourgeois didn't just make work for herself. It was meant for anyone who had ever felt marginalized or experienced personal trauma. And in 2010, the year of her death, she would make one final artwork. The piece was titled, I Do. This print was made for Freedom to Marry, an organization that campaigns for the right of same-sex couples to marry in the United States. And that's all I've got for you today, folks. I'm still flattered and amazed every time my view count goes up by a little or someone else pushes that subscribe button. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I've got a couple more ideas in the works, so stick around. And I hope to see you back here on the next one. Ciao.